And I'm Sean Corcoran, uh, happy to be here. Uh, the third panel here is uh, titled Potentials Arising from New Educational Technologies and Content. We have a very diverse panel, but there is a common theme, I think, in everybody's uh, background. Um, they all are focused on providing some form of solution to education, whether it's a consulting service or a product or a technology. Um, uh, we're, we're all, I think, including myself, we're all trying to help you help uh, students uh, be more successful and learn better. So I will start by um, introducing the, the panel. Uh, Michael King, uh, King. Michael's a worldwide leader for IBM education with responsibility for strategy, marketing, and sales across schools of higher education. IBM's portfolio in education includes consulting and IT services, anal analytics tools, and other software, as well as cloud and high-performance computing. He's been with IBM for over 25 years, with over 20 years in education and learning. He holds uh, degrees in physics, engineering, and an MBA from UCLA in Southern California. Welcome, Michael. Uh, Axel Unger, Unger. Axel is uh, an IDEO partner. Uh, I think some people referred to IDEO recently or today. Uh, founded by David Kelly out in Palo Alto, a Stanford, Stanford professor and also the, the founder of the Stanford D School. Um, and Axel is a managing director at the Munich Studios, committed to pushing innovation and bringing new disruptive solutions to market to create positive impact. Um, Prior to joining IDEO Munich, uh, Axel worked as the head of design at the UK startup Appliance Studio. He also worked as an innovation strategy consultant for Whirlpool in Europe and a senior designer in IDEO's Boston office. With, and he has a, B, a BFA in industrial design from Rhode Island School of Design. Marianne Vogt. Uh, Marianne is co founder and uh, chief executive officer of Better Marks. Along with her partner, she is the driving force behind Bettermark's growth in the emerging field of online learning systems, uh, focusing on uh, making math tutoring accessible and affordable for everyone. She also founded and headed the successful online marketplace, and I'll get this wrong, Immobilin Scout 24. Marianne studied economics at uh, WHU, Otto uh, Besheim School of Management in Koblenz, as well as the University of California, Berkeley, Go Bears. Um, and the University of Lyon. Um, next, uh, Jürgen Boos. Uh, Jürgen trained as a publisher in the early uh, 1980s and has degrees in both marketing and organizational theory. He's held management positions at Dromer Nahr Verlag and Karl Hanser Verlag, both in Munich, as well as Springer Science and Business Media in Berlin. I uh, became executive director at the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2005 and is president of LitProm, the Society for Promotion of African, Asian, Latin American Literature, and is managing director of LitCam, the Frankfurt Book Fair literacy campaign. And number five out of six, um, Alexa Joyce, as worldwide education director of policy, teaching, and learning for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, Alexa supports national and regional governments and other education bodies in transforming education and deploying one-to-one -one device programs in schools across the region. She's got a master's degree in uh, biological sciences from the University of Oxford, an MBA from Solvay Brussels School of Economics and Management, and she's currently uh, pursuing studies in education and technology at the Institute of Education in the UK. And last but not, not least, Sam Weber. Uh, Sam is the head of international business development for Blackboard a global leader in education technology. Uh, based in London, he's responsible for, responsible for developing partnerships between Blackboard and education content providers and technology companies outside of the US. Sam has partnered with companies including Pearson, Macmillan, Wiley, uh, LexisNexis, and, and many more. Uh, Sam also supports Blackboard's, Blackboard's corporate development activities across the company's international division. He's also led uh, acquisition and integration of companies in the UK, Brazil, and Colombia. Uh, very active in the education community, and he was also, it uh, looks like, an English language teacher uh, in C Costa Rica. Uh, he is a BA from the University of Vermont and an MA in international finance from the Fletcher School at Tufts. So I think I'll come over and Sit over here, I guess. Then, then I can see everybody. So I thought I'd start with a question, and they didn't get prompted ahead of time. So uh, this will be hopefully very fresh. Um, 
we all know and we've hear, heard all day here, uh, technology's impact on education is very significant. It's evolving very rapidly. And there are many trends and buzzwords out there. Uh, things like active learning, engaged learning, personalized learning, we just heard that. Uh, blended learning, online learning, learning analytics, MOOCs, it goes on and on. And lots of experimentation and, and I would say promises um, and probably many successes and many failures. So my first question to the panel, and I'll just you, let you uh, raise your hand or start, uh, who would ever like to dive in. Describe the promise versus the reality of the Im impact of new technologies on learning and maybe some of the key activities or solutions you see that are needed to more fully realize that promise. How's that? Got that? So promise versus reality. Who'd like to, who'd like to start? Let me start? Yeah. So um, our promise is um, making maths easier. Um, if I leave it at that, I would say we are getting first examples that we're actually delivering that promise. If at the same time I look at the original time scale that we set ourselves to delivering this on a large scale, I would say we're far behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's taken a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And why do we deliver on this promise? Because we've de developed a system that helps students learn actively, one of mm -hmm. the buzzwords. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to be able to show one of the charts that Broer just showed. Yeah. I mean, not the one where doing something is the same effect as not doing uh, anything, but um, <laughs> more on the left side. Um, and we have um, large groups of users um, in different environments, in Uruguay, in Germany, in the Netherlands. And we're hoping to be able to actually prove that with the, the work we do, the way we help students learn, that we, um, we can prove that it's easier for children to learn math. And we're still working on that. The lum numbers are not yet large enough, but okay, that's... Okay, great. Good. Who's next? I, I would yeah. say the ultimate uh, objective is to get better learning outcomes overall. And we've talked a lot today about you know, how do you scale quality so that every individual can ultimately achieve you know, their full potential. And so that we estimate is probably an order of magnitude increase in capacity for the education industry just to reach the, you know, everyone in the world with that. So the biggest challenge is this isn't just about technology. As you heard Bohr talk just now, it's really about reengineering the process and understanding it and figuring out where do you apply technology in the right way to get those better outcomes. And there's going to be a lot of experimentation, some false starts, but I think we've been making progress over the last few decades and we will continue to do so. But mm -hmm. it's going to be a long, a long journey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. You might wonder what I'm doing on this panel here uh, since I'm representing the Frankfurt Book Fair. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you know the media industry, if you know publishing a little bit, then you probably know that educational publishers are the largest publishers in the world and actually the most profitable. <laughs> If somebody's in the panel here, you might uh, be able to confirm this. Um, so what we are doing, we are mirroring actually what's happening in our world of publishing. And so I have to talk to a lot of people all over the world. I think I talked to maybe 60, 70 ministers of education in the past 10 years. And, and so we somehow I seem to be able to compare different systems and we see what's happening technology-wise. And it's quite interesting when you mentioned Finland before, because I, we had the Finland as guest of honor, and we worked for a very long time together with the government and educators, a lot of publishers, and the big difference seemed to be not technology in the PISA studies, not the number of the teachers, not even the wages or the money the pe teachers get, but the respect, how do you uh, recognize what teachers are really doing about the role of society. And I think we tend to forget that, that it's very important in what we heard before, about uh, uh, educational engineering. I think this is very important. We have to think before we do things. Mm -hmm. yeah? And technology is not uh, a means to actually to save money or uh, to solve our budgetary restrictions. Actually, we need more money to implement technology and to get better results in education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I, th I think what's yeah. interesting about technology, is I, it feels very wasteful at the moment. It feels like the amount of money spent um, in, in trying new methods and tools on a technological level um, is, is almost like a shotgun approach. You know, you, you shoot it at the, <laughs> at the educators and at the, at the students and you kind of see what sticks. Um, I think our, from my experience, our, our company is, is 
our business is design and innovation. Um, so it's about actually um, solving complex problems with in an ambiguous and um, yeah un undefined world, mm -hmm. um, and not knowing what what the result will be. And what we found to be much more effective there is actually to start with with the humans involved, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the learners and that's the educators themselves, and to un really understand. What, what are the needs, what are the problems, and then figuring out, okay, which technology will we use uh, to solve that? And, mm -hmm. and then um, not stopping even there, but, but, but then prototyping solutions and seeing in a very quick way, are we getting the kind of outcomes we were hoping for? What are we learning? Mm -hmm. um, instead of kind of going ahead and, and assuming a lot of things um, and pushing kind of technology on top of people. So that very much speaks to sort of problem finding, not just problem solving. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, and what, what I think is interesting when you do that process is it often brings up, it questions the original question and the original mm -hmm. challenge. Mm -hmm. So you all of a sudden uh, discover, wait, the, the, you know, the much more interesting problem might be this to solve. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I think it, it, it does is it, it puts the human at the center again. You know, we believe very much that, that um, people have the creativity and the, and, and, and the mindset and the power to actually solve a lot of these, the, 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 their own challenges, so mm -hmm. to say, given the right uh, training, education, given the right tools and the right environment. So it's, it's more about designing those things for those people mm -hmm. and then letting them choose what technologies and what tools they need and, and how to adapt those tools to, to the tasks. Right, okay. And I, I, I can think of a, uh, you make me think of a story that, a project that we were working on and we are very focused on this whole idea of active learning and engaged learning and we said, and we started to get these, these, these questions from educators, can you help us figure out how to design a large active classroom? You know, beyond the 30, 40, 50 stu students, maybe, you know, 75, 100, 150, an active lecture hall. I mean, you could call it that. And so we actually started looking at that, and, we, and so the first thing we did is, you know, actually using the IDEO approach, we went out and we tried to find <laughs> some examples. And as we, as, we, as, as we observed classes in those classrooms, um, we noticed that in some cases, um, I mean, it was so dependent on the teacher's ability to teach in that classroom, and they'd have to change their approach. It wasn't effective at all. So we started to ask ourselves the question, are, are we working on the right problem? Have we asked the right question? Should we be trying to figure out how to create a large active classroom? Or should we be asking the question, why do we have large classrooms? And is that still relevant going forward in you know, the age of MOOCs and online learning and things like that? So, so we're starting to, to morph that. Sam, any other thoughts? Yeah, for, for me, it's pretty straight, it, it feels fairly straightforward. It feels like the challenge we face is one of adoption more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I feel like we're, depending on the technology you're talking about, the institution you're talking about, um, we're moving from a f phase where um, we're moving from a sort of broad availability phase to one mm -hmm. of adoption. Um, mm -hmm. And we're certainly seeing that across the platforms that we developed that have been used for a long time, and I think that's a real positive, and we're starting to see, based on um, sort of trends across the, the, the customer base that we have, um, a much more strategic approach to how technologies are actually made available such that adoption drives decisions being made across institutions mm -hmm. on how they choose, implement, support technologies. So I'll pay you later, because that tees up exactly my, my second question, um, and we didn't speak before. Um, where do you see, in your experience, the biggest barriers uh, lying in the adoption of adoption of the most effective technology and content solutions for teaching and learning? So what, what, what are those barriers that you're running into? I guess I'll let you <laughs> take it further at first. What, some examples maybe. Yeah, I, I think it starts sort of at a fairly high level. So to the extent that there is um, a, a strategy in place and um, uh, a, a set of um, organizing principles around that and, and, a, and a program to implement technology, the, the adoption and success rates around the usage of it are much higher than those that are procured for whatever sets of reasons, right? Um, because it's the end of a budget cycle or because it looks good in press release or something. Mm -hmm. um, and 
to, so the, the, the barriers have a lot to do with the kind of support um, you see in, in institutions. I think, I think it's convenient to talk about kind of generational gaps with instructors and lack of um, familiarity and willingness to use technology. I feel like that's sort of a convenient description of why mm -hmm. we're not seeing adoption. I think it has more to do with um, uh, the kind of support and the kind of literally at, at a strategic level how institutions think about technology and how it should be used and how courses are organized and designed and run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other comments on adoption? Yeah. I think um, we heard a little bit earlier today about the availability of connectivity in schools, and I think mm -hmm. that's still a massive problem here in mm -hmm. Europe. We tend to think that the um, infrastructure issue is solved and that there's sufficient devices and sufficient infrastructure, and I think that's really still quite far from being the case. Wow. Um, and it's you know great that students have access to things like smartphones, but that's not necessarily a device for learning. It's hard to interact effectively with a large simulation showing a complex scientific principle when you've got a really tiny screen. So mm -hmm. I think we still need to think carefully about what's the kind of right device for learning, what's the right kind of connectivity that needs to be available in schools for learning. And also we need to think very carefully about how we design it from every level of the system perspective. And mm -hmm. that strategic point that you mentioned about having a very carefully designed strategy needs to happen not just at national ministry level, but at regional level, at school level, and then at individual classroom level. And I think the capacity of leaders who are taking those kind of decisions about what that strategy looks like is not there at every level of the system. So we have lots of training out there, which is about how to use X tool or Y tool, or mm -hmm. even on technology embedded pedagogy. But I don't see the capacity there in terms of that design process for how it's actually going to happen hmm. in the school system. Hmm. So if, if, if effective um, implementation of technology um, that will drive adoption lives in a context, that is much broader than the technology itself. It's not technology for technology's sake. What are some of those contexts or some of those factors that you're seeing um, in the ecosystem of teaching and learning that affect poor, poor implementation of technology? Yeah, so I think coming back to that, that user needs scenario, and what, what is the technology actually being put in, in there for? So we still see that there's a lot of those kind of political decision make, mm -hmm. decisions made where we say we want to tick a box and have a one-to-one -one program in place because that is a good thing to do. But rather yeah, for saying, what purpose? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, is it going to be for increasing achievement in mathematics? Is it going to be for bridging the digital divide? Are we doing it to um, reduce dropout rates by offering more engaging learning experiences? And we need to make sure that we're really clear about what is that fundamental educational challenge that we're trying to address through the technology before we start to even take any decision about what that infrastructure or the training program is going to look like. Right, right. Yeah, I would, I would like to support this. Uh, and on the one hand, we have very sophisticated systems, and we do train a lot of people how to use the systems. But is the content as sophisticated which we have to use on these systems? And I think we have to think about the content first and then on the, on, to think mm -hmm. about the device. And this is actually where I do believe we are still far behind. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an area where we're still missing a lot of information. Um, if I look at those um, uh, areas where this, our system seems to work, it's either an environment where there's a strong political will, as for example, Plan Cibal, the One Laptop a Child initiative in Uruguay, there's a mm -hmm. strong political will, not just once, but on, in, on, on, in a long term, you know, doing the upfront investment in terms of hardware, but also realizing it works, it doesn't work, we need software, we need to train, and we have to get through that time where half of the Uruguayan public school system is on strike because they don't feel like working with it. We have to, we have to get through that time and we have to be able to produce, um, produce results and produce arguments for this. That's, that's one part. And the other part, part is teachers, uh, in, be it in, in, in Germany or in, or in Mexico basically, teachers that have no support whatsoever but that say, I want to try this out, I want to be able to do this. If nobody pays for it, I'll collect the money somewhere. This is obviously more a German issue than in Mexico. I'll try it out. And I think it's very important that the system enables these, these trials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the case everywhere. There's rather a big political initiative mm -hmm. because everybody seems to think, to feel this has to be done centrally. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, I mean, the ability to, to prototype and test yes. and, and Rapidly. The, the very challenging situation of failing, yes. <laughs> you know, yes, such absolutely. a, you know, a big, big issue. I, I also feel that this is a, a more systematic um, issue. Like if you have 
Um, if you change none of the elements of the current system and you put just new technology on top of that, I don't believe you're going to see a lot of impact um, mm -hmm. uh, because you're not really using the technology to its full potential. And I think, especially we've been talking a lot about digital, I think that digital is not just a new technology, it's not just a new channel, it's not, not you know, it, I think it radically changes all aspects of, of, it should change all aspects of education. Uh, the role of the teacher, the role of the students, where education happens, how education happens, how, how we can personalize, how we can massify w what we're talking about. I think, I, I mean, one privileged example that we're, we were uh, allowed and able to work on um, is, is a new school system in Peru. So uh, Carlos Pastor, a very successful entrepreneur in Peru, he came to us with a very enlightened vision. He said, I want to I wanna have a significant impact on the educational system in Peru because I want to um, support the sort of rising middle class and that can only happen through education. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want an education that's affordable, that's excellent, and that's scalable. Um, and so I think if, if you want to, if, if you look at that, you could say, okay, is, is, is this about sort of putting tablets in, in or, or online le learning courses in classrooms? But instead, we looked at it really as a, okay, we need to change all aspects of that system. Mm -hmm. So this was about designing a business model, um, uh, designing the school buildings themselves, designing the classroom spaces, designing the furniture, designing the tools, designing uh, all the way to actually, for example, um, a program that helps teachers continuously learn. Because one of the big challenges in, in Peru was actually getting enough uh, great and educated teachers. There w just weren't enough to go around, so mm -hmm. to say. So it's also about, for example, um, a continuous educational program for them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, 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 and the results have been great, the outcomes have been great, but I think that only worked because technology um, was used in the context of, of actually designing, intentionally designing, all the elements of, a, of, of this ecosystem mm -hmm. um, and empowering the, the people in that ecosystem in the, in, in the most. So if you look at this example, the question is, is it the issue of a greenfield approach? Yeah. Because that's what you're talking Which about. The question is, what's going yeah. to be the difference for the Peru system? Is it going to be um, they can see what works and they can, they can try parts of it as well? Or is it just a divide? Yeah, I think the, I mean, the, 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 other, the other way I see technology by the way, um, working is, the one thing is the greenfield approach. The other thing is, is actually providing technology and skills um, so that not we as designers or we as companies or institutions design the solution for the teachers and for the, uh, for, for the students, but the, giving the students and the teachers the, the skills and the technology so they design their own solutions, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. um, and, and do that iteratively. So I, I think that's another, that, that, so, so there's a greenfield, almost top-down approach, mm -hmm. and I think that that's the other approach we see. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the things, yeah. though, I, I hear that, that we see, and I'm hearing through this discussion, though, is, a, is, a, is some new maturity coming in about learning. We do back office systems as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not an, you know, educators and education institutions don't how to implement new payroll systems and new financial systems, and they're massive projects. And our consulting teams implement those for tens of millions of dollars at a lot of institutions, and it starts with really understanding the project objectives. You do change management across the institution. There's training for the users. It's not just about the technology. It truly is a, a big project for these institutions. We're only now starting to see that amount of matured th thinking going into learning projects, which you just described in Peru is like that. I mean, a lot of times we'll see failed projects of one-to-one -one where it's, well, let's give every kid a device and hope something happens. So I do think there's more maturity now being brought into these learning projects where they are being done much more thoughtfully with the right investment in a lot of areas besides just the technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I would say certainly from the, the design ethic that, that the company I work for has taken over the last few years, I think a, a positive we're seeing, I think generally speaking across the, the industry, is that folks who are building, it's building platforms and products and technologies for, generally speaking, for institutions, are taking a much more learner-centric approach to all the things that they design, whether right. they have a much more sort of empathetic ethic to how they actually capture information around what informs their design process, and if that means literally shadowing their end users, not necessarily their paying customer, 
to help them inform what their design process is, or in our case, we just because we've been doing it for so long, being able to actually aggregate a huge amount of information from our end users to help then impact that design process. And then, frankly, design products specific to individual roles. Mm -hmm. We can then help those institutions tailor what is becoming more of a pull process for adoption, <clears throat> right? The demand is actually coming, in many cases, from learners who are demanding easier, better, simpler products to use mm -hmm. that, in many cases, are pose a challenge for institutions who are trying to solve, in some cases, other problems. They're trying to figure out how to do scalability and make it easier for, for, for other constituents to figure out how to use these systems. So that, that's a, a real common theme that I hear around the globe. You know, moving from a, a, a teacher-centered to a learner-centered uh, environment, and we, we heard a lot about that, that today as far as you know, personalized learning and you know, Brewer's great talk about how do we actually learn and et cetera. Um, you know, sticking on the topic of, of adoption and, and maybe barriers to that for a minute, to what extent, in your experience, do we have a challenge in, in getting adoption at the faculty side, uh, the teacher side, the professor side, in, in creative ways to get them to adopt? Uh, and what are some of the challenges there? I think of, you know, an example of interactive uh, classroom technologies at the, front of, at the front of the room. You know, interactive whiteboards, interactive projectors, and I, I hear a lot that it's one thing to teach the teacher how to use the technology. It's another, another barrier is how do you get the teacher up to speed to actually change the way they teach with that technology? And that's a different process. So any, any thoughts on, on that part? Yeah. I think there's actually a phase. I mean, we often think that if teachers are just at the point where they're cloning their old-fashioned teaching processes using technology, then that's a bad thing that, that we've failed. Right. But actually, when you look at the research, teachers have to go through that part before they can get to the mm -hmm. next stage. They have to feel comfortable doing what they did before using that technology before they can actually start to innovate. So I think we, we need to account for that as being a legitimate stage we have to get through before mm -hmm. we can go further. And from my perspective, I think then switching to more the innovative pedagogical methods, that then becomes, on one hand, a training issue, looking at how can we make sure that teachers have access to that training in, mm -hmm. whether it's inquiry-based learning or 21st century learning design, all of those kind of more flexible approaches which we know are effective with students. That's a key part of it. But it's also about enabling the space within the education system for that to happen. And mm -hmm. the way that we structure assessment still makes it extremely difficult to do project-based learning across subjects mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the students are still going to be assessed at the end of the right. school year with you know, their sudden death exams in maths and physics separately. So until we have a reform at the, the different parts of the education system, the whole ecosystem. Yeah, we're yeah. still not providing the incentives for the teachers to actually go forward and, and be more radical in their pedagogical yeah. approaches in mm -hmm. most cases. I don't know. The, the example that I think, I think this stuff still happens, though. I mean, I think one of my favorite examples is um, it's a school in um, southern Sweden, and the way they deal with adoption of new technologies across the campus, so um, medium-sized institution with multiple disciplines, is they always start with the nursing department. Because nurses, when they're introduced with new technologies, just don't have a choice. They have to, put, they have to figure out how to use it immediately, because mm -hmm. the stakes are really, really high. Mm -hmm. And across the other academic departments, they're not necessarily regarded as the strongest academic group. And so what the organization that's responsible for implementing technology turns around and says to the other departments is, well, they figured out how to use it. And they do it with across a variety of technologies in that institution. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are techniques, I should say. One thing, I, 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 not being an educator, I still find fascinating, maybe it's not the, quite the right word, but the fact that um, K-12, we say K-12, kindergarten through high school educators in the U.S., are required to learn how to teach. And that's not the case in higher ed. So, so is there a, a schism here between you know, what we can accomplish in, say, K-12 versus higher ed, and how might that influence what happens in higher ed? Well, there's one, one issue for K-12 for, for, I would say, for Germany, for other European countries as well, I'm sure it's the same elsewhere, is that they may have been required to teach, but there's a, an increasingly large number of people that is not teaching their subject. Huh. Mm -hmm. or has not learned to teach that subject. So there will be a large number, especially in primary schools, mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of teachers who have not learned to teach math, but they will be teaching math. That's a big, that's a big, big issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think Excellent. another huge paradigm shift happening at the moment is that 
because the world is changing and we're talking about digital and all this kind of thing, um, it means that teachers are going from being only teachers for life to actually being learners and, and students themselves for life. So um, it's not, so I think the key challenge is how do you give them the tools and the, and the means to, to do that continuously and, and then build up their confidence um, so that they can themselves essentially go on, on this um, path where, where the outcome is not defined and where you don't know what will I be teaching in five years, how will I be teaching that, um, etc. So, so essentially, I mean, we're, we're seeing this movement um, in, in the US. Um, IDEO published uh, free downloadable um, uh, a design thinking toolkit, toolkit for educators um, that empowers essentially um, uh, teachers and educators to, to, to create their own solutions continuously and to reinvent uh, what they teach and how they teach it. Um, and, and the second phase of that now, we, we, we also launched a platform called the Teachers Guild. Um, and that's actually connecting teachers amongst each other um, to, to work on challenges and, and, and to redefine that. Mm -hmm. So I think this, this idea of, the, uh, so uh, ironically, I think that the teachers are becoming students in essence uh, as well. So um, uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really And, and in terms of adoption, shift. sorry, it's, it's also a question of um, letting people discover these things by themselves in some way. Mm -hmm. We have um, schools yeah. We have mm -hmm. schools where teachers have stumbled across um, better marks. They have tried, they've tried it out. They've tried to actually convince some of their colleagues. They've just started using it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, in some cases, that is quite an effort because they need to get find the budget and they need to explain to, other, uh, to their colleagues why they're doing something different. However, once they've done that and they've become um, fluent with it, they will be um, a great start to actually um, either say, well, I'm not going to do it, but convince their colleagues and then try to convince the whole uh, faculty of using such a system. And that's a much more helpful way um, than trying to convince just the, the head of the school mm -hmm. to um, actually put some content on the great hardware um, the school has bought whenever, mm -hmm. um, which, um, which can be faster in the first, uh, in the first instance, but then um, just take a lot longer to actually adopt. You know, I think one of the things that, that we've seen, certainly in the United States, is we got a little crosswise because it was we were either adopting technology for technology's sake or maybe there was even a punitive measurement issue behind it. And how do we assess how yeah. well teachers are doing or how well schools are performing? And I think what we've seen in healthcare is the reverse of that. It's about how do you treat the frontline employee, in this case a doctor, as a professional and give them tools. So one of the first uh, areas of commercializing the Watson self-learning system that we won the Jeopardy game show with was around a physician's advisor, uh, particularly with oncology. So we've been doing a lot of work, and we're rolling out this fall a Watson teacher advisor, uh, focusing initially in, in the U.S. to help teachers adapt to the new Common Core national, you know, the, uh, the new standards, and doing it in a way we've tested this out with a lot of teachers. They want to do it at night, they want to do it privately, not in front of their peers or their students. So we've really been trying to listen a lot to the teachers and just reversing this model. If you, you know, give someone that something that is really a value to them, helps them with their job, I think that will change the adoption mm -hmm. curve a lot. So, so maybe one last question on this. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to know what, what you think about um, the, the challenge that the teachers have. We hear all the time about how, especially in K-12, how teachers are just overworked, you know, I mean, to, it's, it's one thing to get through the day, grade all the papers, you know, get ready for the next day. It's another to change the way you teach, invest the time to do that, and make a, you know, a significant change in, in your approach. Um, different maybe in, in higher ed, but to what extent in your, your experience is that a, a, a major issue, a minor issue, a medium issue, and then what can we do about that, I mean, effectively? Well, I mean, it, I think it's common knowledge that teachers are not the most innovative um, uh, professional. Perhaps that's, that's well the way that is, uh, we, compared to the previous panel, talking about uh, how long has it taken for the schools to come become the way they have become. Um, but um, uh, I think we need to take this into account by making it as easy as possible by accepting that they have to have easy access. We don't, we, we have, I think, all of us have great ideas about what you can do with technology and you have to start with, with very small 
um, uh, use, usage, very, very, very simple um, uh, functions that actually work. And, um, uh, not, and know that they take time. And know also that there's this 10 to 15% who will be very energetic about using it, and you just have to use them as ambassadors. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to show that it works to mm -hmm. make other uh, teachers comfortable with investing the energy, because it will need, they will need to invest energy. Mm -hmm. So that gets directly at the motivation yes. issue, yep. which uh, Brewer talked about earlier. Absolutely. What will motivate them? Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't agree on that, because what I'm seeing, at least in Germany, is that our curriculum and our political systems are changing every two to three years, so the teachers have to adapt this, to these changes. And I think this occupies them a lot more than actually the day-to-day -day life and technology. Yeah? When you get a new curriculum every two years, you have to start all over again. And then only the second step is to sort out how you teach. But the advantage is that with a system like Wettermarks, for example, the curriculum is embedded um, in this system. So as a teacher, you don't have to change your books or change the way you teach. Um, the, the one um, uh, big effort you have to do in one point in time is um, integrating this into your, your classroom, and everybody does that differently. No, that's fine, but if you change the system, if you go from 13 grades to 12 grades, yeah, if you go from the Gesamtschule to Gymnasium, or all you change these school types, and this is what's happening here, at least in a few states, I think this is what occupies everything. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, that is a big challenge, but it's also an opportunity to rebuild how you're sure. organizing your school. Sure. And so in the UK, we're seeing that the shift towards, for instance, the academy school status has prompted an, an enormous amount of technical innovation in the way that education is organized. So um, there's a school that uh, we work with from the hometown where I come from in the UK called Charlands Academy. And they're in a part of the UK which is very poor. They've got very high transient population. Lots of people are asylum seekers. And um, many of the parents don't even register with the local authorities because they're worried they're going to be sent back to the countries that they've come from. So really difficult circumstances. As they shifted to being an academy, they decided to set up partnerships with technology companies like Microsoft, and they decided to dive in deep, going for flipped learning methodologies, even with this very tricky population of students. Mm -hmm. They've used devices at home for doing all their homework. They've got personalized homework systems so they can get different types of homework depending on their level of achievement. And this school has gone from being one of the low achieving schools in the region to being classed consistently in the last three inspections as being an ex excellent and outstanding school in terms of the quality of learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think using those kinds of massive system changes as a motor to also make that pedagogical change is possible, but it takes really courageous leadership and it takes mm -hmm. leaders who are not just brilliant at the change management piece that you were describing, but also have that pedagogical insight and that pedagogical vision that can take you somewhere really exciting and empowering for students and teachers. Great. So, so I have a, a question um, that's related to a topic that's come up several times today, the MOOC. And there, um, Daphne Kohler, uh, one of the founders of, of Coursera, was asked at a conference, you, you may have heard this, um, somebody in the audience asked, well, so should we be worried about MOOCs? I mean, is, should we, is this going to really dramatically change um, our institutions? Uh, and, and her answer was something along the lines of, well, only those institutions who use content delivery as their primary teaching method or their, te their pedagogy. So, so my question, so that really raises the question, um, if more and more teaching, I'll call it, and learning is going online, not all, but more, um, as, as lecture becomes less, we heard that multiple times today, and, and other pedagogies are being employed more and more, we're going to much more multimodal learning, um, lecture, discussion, problem-based learning, et cetera. Uh, the question is, if you project out you experts, if you project out 10 to 15 years, I, I decided I couldn't even go to 20 because things are changing so fast. <laughs> but if you project out 10 to 15 years, what will the physical classroom look like? Um, and how will technology cause that? I, 
I don't well, see. I, oh, sorry. And I was going to say, I always ask the question about MOOCs changing education. If you're being wheeled into the ER for open heart surgery, do you want the surgeon that learned all in a MOOC, or do you want the one that had some face-to-face -face <laughs> eye experience <laughs> in, a you know, in, a, in, a, in a medical school? So I think, you know, it's technology is going to continue. When I started 30 years ago, I remember uh, uh, Apple had a famous 1984 ad because there was this big market share battle between IBM, PC, and Macintosh at that time. And, they were, and the two companies were fighting over about a half a million units a year in sales. Think about that. This year we'll ship over, there will be over a billion units shipped of tablets and smartphones and things around the globe, right? So it's just a, and Apple and IBM are partners now. So the world has you know, changed, but the technology is, is dramatic. If you think about virtual reality and the ability to start offering a simulation for a, a surgeon to actually, a, a prospective surgeon to learn in a VR world. I mean, all these, we're gonna have tremendous changes in 10 to 15 years. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of different digital experiences that people can have that can, be, can become a mix of the part. There will be a, a, you know, a role for a MOOC or a role for online experiences to learn certain things. There's going to be a role for simulation. There's going to be a role for face-to-face. -face. And I think education and the biggest challenge is back to the, it's not the technology, it's figuring out the pedagogical and re-engineering to what works best where and how do we change the way and, and incorporate all this into the instructional process. Yeah, that, that to me is, the, the, I mean, both moves as well as the question about space and where it will happen is kind of the same. I think um, my hope is, and, and you're seeing this uh, today, is that I think, I think we'll move to a world where, you know, there'll, there'll be many places. There will be libraries, there will be physical schools, there will be MOOCs, there will be YouTube videos where people teach themselves things. I mean, um, and, and you will have team-based learning and project-based learning, and I, I think there'll be a huge diversity of things, and, and it will be much more sort of market or student or teacher pull-driven to say, okay, what do I need when? And, and then, almost like a kind of selection, natural selection, people will go, okay, I think this seems to work for this type of thing, this seems to work for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think place, content, um, um, interactions, um, channels will be selected based on, on need and not on, on, on sort of top-down, uh, so, so yeah, not, not in top-down way. So, so I'll say I, th I think a lot of the institutions, or a lot of universities in particular say, particularly elite universities, may look exactly like they look like today in, what, what was your time frame? 10 to 15. Great. Um, <laughs> but the challenge here is, I think it has been talked about in other panels, right? Just to keep even the percentage of our population that completes a tertiary education, we don't have close to the capacity to meet that over the, that time frame. Mm -hmm. And so how you, um, how learners learn and where they learn and, and how they achieve success and competency against some form of measurable, out measurable outcomes is going to look very different for lots of different people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, some of the, the existing infrastructure today will look very similar because it, it's pretty terrific at some level. Um, but some of what you're just referring to um, about place and, and um, will look very different. And I think MOOCs to a certain extent, or however they're defined, I've heard Maybe they're now going to be called spooks in some circumstances, right? Because they're smaller and more specialized, and um, will continue to, to to exist. And frankly, I think they'll grow. Yeah, mm -hmm. there was an interesting article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, probably a year or so ago, and and they they asked the question regarding MOOCs. Well, is is, is a MOOC a, an alternative to teaching, or will it become the 21st century book? So maybe you're going to ask. I'll point that one to you. Um, I thought that was really interesting. I mean, it's just it spoke to the multimedia aspect in the of uh, of a MOOC as opposed to a you know physical book. Co this, this raises another question: What is a book? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yes, it can be a book. Yeah, a MOOC uh -huh. can be a book, but a book can also be something else. But what, what I'm seeing is actually it's everything existing at the same time. And it needs a lot of what we heard about educational engineering to find out which product does deliver the best results and in which situation as well and in which society 
which level of society, there are a lot more questions. So it's not going to be one school mm -hmm. or one perfect classroom of the future, but probably it, it's a lot. It's a lot has to do with contingency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 I think digital does help. Yeah, to customize learning a lot, and to to uh, so it fits perfectly for the situation or the teaching situation you are in. So I, I hope hopefully we'll get a lot of better better educational, better fitting educational systems. So more, well, if not personalized, more access certainly. Yep. Um, there was an article in the, uh, uh, I think it was in the Inside Higher Education Online uh, recently and, and somebody asked uh, the question, what will, this, what will the campus of 2020 look like? And I can only remember two of the answers. One was, um, there will be, and this wasn't his, uh, uh, term, but the, the sort of the platinum, you know, um, offering, and then the, and there will be a widening of the gap between the upper and the and the lower levels uh, for the reasons that you kind of indicated. Uh, the other thing he said is classrooms are going to be a lot nicer <laughs> because they'll have to get a lot nicer to stay relevant in the face of all these uh, technology uh, alternatives. Um, Sam, something you said. Um, you know, uh, when I asked the question about five, or 10 or 15 years, what will the campus look like? And, and you said, well, for some of the, I don't know, again, the platinum brands, the, the top, top universities won't look much different. Mm -hmm. I asked uh, recently a, a provost from a major university in the US, um, who, who is your competition today and who will it be in 10 years? And I really didn't know what she'd say to the second question, but the first question, she kind of named off the usual suspects that I would have expected her to, and she thought for a minute on the second question, she said, the same. And I was looking for how much does she feel under pressure? You know, the comment uh, this morning about, do we, do we need a crisis? I mean, I sense no crisis whatsoever in her mind about her institution and, you know, alternatives, so. Um, I don't maybe, know how much. I think maybe, yeah. maybe the crisis comes when those students are able to cobble together um, something that looks like a measurable form of competency picked up through completion of a set of online courses, or maybe it's not even a course, um, are being recruited and hired into the firms that typically came to her campus to recruit students. Good point. When that yeah. starts to happen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Things will change dramatically. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I'm not sure how much time we have, but uh, are we... We don't. Five minutes? Yeah, five minutes. Okay, so maybe we'll... Uh, great great uh, discussion, folks. Uh, maybe we'll turn it over to the, uh, the aud audience for any questions or comments. One back there. Uh, do we have a mic? Let everybody wake up, turn the lights up. <laughs> You've been great. It's Hello, late. I'm Gerard Danford from Helsinki. And just a quick question. Um, there are a lot of drivers that are causing these changes that are occurring, you know, whether they be economic, demographic, technological, etc. And I'm curious about your opinion about competition in a way. In the, in the North American market, there's a significant private educational market there, and they have been very aggressive in moving into the online marketplace and have taken a large part of that market. And the others are, of course, been observing that trend. In Europe, on the other hand, you don't have this, or forgive me, to the same extent, this kind of private, sec private education. And do you see that as a, a disadvantage in a way because you don't have that one other pressure for change in a way, you know, which is significant sometimes, at least whether it may not be a threat, but at least one is observing that mm -hmm. and what's going on. So competition, Comments? private competition. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, if you look at, at Germany, there's uh, definitely a very small part of the education takes place in the private sector, but it has increased. And if you look at the numbers of schools that are being set up um, newly by 
groups of parents who say mm -hmm. we, we want to change something. There is a relevant number of these um, mm -hmm. startup schools in Germany. Um, I think overall the sector only covers about 10%, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a recent article in The Economist about um, private education in, in so-called developing countries, um, especially in, in Africa, and I'm sure you've heard about Bridge Academy, companies mm -hmm. that try to um, offer education at a very low price, and, and they say that in some of these countries, uh, almost 50% of the relevant education is already taking pr place in the so-called private sector because mm -hmm. parents have decided to, to vote with their feet. Right. It's about 2% in the U.S. with charter schools, which is, you know, uh, uh, also a place to experiment. So, mm -hmm. the green field. Uh, one more question? Yeah. Mike up front. And then, Richard, would, it, would we wrap after this? Just a okay. short comment. It's uh, actually uh, connected. You said that classrooms have to get nice uh, to stay relevant. But uh, what about the public schools? I mean, they, you know, there's practically no choice, so they, they could, I mean, they will stay relevant by, by law, so what, what's, the, what's the solution there? I mean, for the private sector, of course, they, they, will, they will get nice and nicer. I'm not sure that the public sector is going to stay the way it is, because, I mean, if you look at, well, at for example, if you look at Africa, I mean, the, 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 the yeah. desolate situation there has led to an upcoming private sector even at a very, very, very low uh, price tag. And, and, and I think that, I mean, you see this in other industries, you know, where big monopolies are being crushed now by this kind of new wave of globalization and digitalization. And I think, and, and, and we, so we just heard that there's all these kind of new startup schools happening. And I think, I think they will set the new standard and the expectation and, and they will put massive amounts of pressure, I think, on the public school system. Yes, that's correct. I think that's, that's exactly the point. The massive pressure and on the other hand the risk that technology actually broadens the divide yes. instead of closing it. Right. So, yeah. right. uh, and, and the public school system in the middle sandwiched and uh, of course there are great differences. I mean we had uh, Marco Marcoli from the regions here so we have these 300 regions with massive difference. I mean in Italy you have the northern regions that are like, like almost like Finland I would say. <laughs> Then we have other regions, and so I think uh, there are massive differences, of course, also with that respect. Great. Well, let's thank our panel. Nice, nice job. Thank you. Thank you.